everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. It's been a long time since I've done a cultural analysis video, like a long, long time. Uh, so it's time that we do a close examination of one of the many cultures of the Wheel of Time. In today's video, we'll be examining one of the most important and most distinct cultures in all of fantasy literature. Today we'll be looking at the Desert Warriors, the Aiel. This video is brought to you by one of my patrons, Sergeant Shewolf. Patrons that support me at the chosen level or higher get to sponsor and choose a video topic, and this was her choice. And a damn good one it is. If you'd like to sponsor a video or check out the other perks of supporting the channel, make sure to check out my Patreon to see how you can help. I am currently running a promotion on Patreon that's going to last for another two weeks or so. Anyone who signs up to support at the Dreadlord level or higher will receive not only the perks for that level, but also 10% off all items at www.shopwheeloftime.com. You can snag books, Wheel of Time merch, maps, a whole bunch of other stuff, and all of it supports the channel and the website. Let's throw up a spoiler warning for the video. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red, with major spoilers running all the way through A Memory of Light. If you haven't read all of the books, watch this at your own risk. It's going to be here when you get done. You have been warned. Now, since it's been a while since I've done a cultural examination video, let me quickly give you an outline of how I do these. I'm going to break the analysis into 10 sections to really help formulate my thoughts. Those sections are as follows. History, demographics and culture, geography, economy, governmental structure and law, military, overall power, significant landmarks, significance to the story, and what happens after the books. And at the end of the video, I'll give my general thoughts on the Aiel and let you know what I think about their culture as a whole within the story. So let's go ahead and dive in. Aiel history dates all the way back to the Age of Legends. Now, during the Age of Legends, the Aiel were referred to as the Daishane Aiel, which in the old tongue means people to peace dedicated. The Daishane Aiel served the Aes Sedai of the time, and they followed the way of the Leap, which means they followed a lifestyle of complete nonviolence for any reason. The Daishane Aiel were known to everyone as humble and inoffensive, and they were very well respected, uh, and the idea of harming an Aiel, even unintentionally, was completely unheard of and thought of as vile in the Age of Legends. Now, Daishane Aiel would serve the same Aes Sedai for most of their life, with each Aes Sedai having a number of different Daishane that served them. In general, Daishane Aiel in the Age of Legends were very devoted to following the Aes Sedai and what the Aes Sedai stood for as an organization. They served the servants of all. Now, Daishane Aiel would help with the basic tasks for the Aes Sedai, being secretarial work, helping them... Uh, research. They would help in food production along with the Ogier and the Nim by singing and helping plants grow. As the Age of Legends collapsed, though, and the breaking of the world began, the male Aes Sedai went completely mad and started destroying the world. Now, many of the Daishane still tried to serve their Aes Sedai, and they tried to stop the carnage, but to no avail. Thousands of Daishane Aiel joined hands and sang to one male Aes Sedai to try to stop his madness and remind him of his humanity but he killed each one of them one by one as they sang, but they did save the residents of the large Age of Legends city, Zora. As the world fell to pieces, what remained of the female Aes Sedai tasked the Daishane Aiel of carrying many wagons of objects of the power to safety and away from the male Aes Sedai. They were given thousands of wagons filled with objects of the power and several thousand cuttings of the Chora trees and set to the task of taking themselves and the objects of power to safety. So the Daishane Aiel set off, and they journeyed throughout the breaking of the world, seeking safety. After some time, possibly generations, while journeying, the Aiel were attacked by bandits. In the aftermath of that attack, a group of the Aiel led by a man named Sulwin campaigned for the Aiel to stop protecting the items from the Aes Sedai and just find safety for themselves and seek the lost songs. After they were rebuked by Adan, the leader of the Aiel, they left the main group and took their wagons, and Adan decreed that those who left could no longer be called Aiel, and they became the Tuatha'an, or the traveling people. They still followed the way of the leaf, but they no longer traveled with the Aiel or believed in their mission from the Aes Sedai. Neither the Tinkers, as they would come to be called, or the Aiel outside of the Wise Ones and the Clan Chiefs even remembered this split, or the similar origins of their culture. This was the first of many blows to the Daishane's mission. Over the many years of traveling, the Aiel were attacked and robbed many, many times. On one occasion, a group of Aiel were taken captive by raiders. Now, one of the Aiel, Lewin, grabbed a spear when one of the raiders was attacking their group and killed that raider in self-defense, saving the others in the group. When they returned to the Aiel camp and it was discovered that Lewin had killed the raider, he was told to hide his face because he was no longer Aiel and had broken the covenant and the way of the leaf. This group that was willing to defend themselves grew over time and they referred to themselves as the Aiel people. 
They refused to pick up a sword still, clinging to the old traditions that they believed gave them permission to kill only because they used a spear which could be used for more than killing. The group of Aiel that refused to fight and maintained the covenant with the Aes Sedai came to be known as the Gen Aiel, or true dedicated in the old tongue. The two groups of Aiel remained together for generations begrudgingly. The Gen didn't want them around, but the, uh, the warrior Aiel would follow them to protect them. Now, that Aiel warrior group grew larger and larger as more and more Gen decided to forsake the covenant and defend themselves. They came to see themselves as the defenders of the Gen. Now, during their journeys, they were helped by a tribe of people that would later become the kingdom of Kyrian. They were given water freely and they weren't mistreated, something that the Aiel people remembered and would later repay in giving the Kyrian and people access to Shara and trading across the Aiel waste and the gold road. The Aiel people crossed the spine of the world and finally found safety, from other people at least, within what would become known as the Aiel waste. The Gen Aiel settled in an area in the mountains and began to build what would become the city of Roydion. So all of these Terangrial were stored there, including a Terangrial that would help the Aiel remember their past and inform them of what would come and their role in the last battle. The last of the Gen Aiel and the Aes Sedai died, but they created a tradition with all of the Aiel clans that wise ones would visit Roydion twice and clan chiefs would visit once to learn the history of their people. The Aiel would settle in the waste and fight amongst themselves for many years, but isolated from the rest of the world. They settled in the harsh climate of the waste, which they attributed as punishment for failing the Aes Sedai. Now, at the time of the Trolloc Wars, around a thousand years after the breaking of the world, the Trollocs invaded the Westlands and wrecked havoc on civilization there, essentially destroying the ten nations that had been rebuilt after the breaking of the world. There was a similar invasion in the Aiel Waste, but the Trollocs and other Shadowspawn were defeated by the harsh conditions of the Waste and the Aiel Warriors. The Trollocs came to call the Waste the Dying Ground. Now in 509 of the New Age, roughly 500 years prior to the start of the story, the Aiel presented the Kyrianan people with a sapling from the last surviving Chora tree in Roydion called Avendelor Adera, and gave them access to trade across the waste with Shara for silks and other goods like spices. This was again in response to the Kyrian once helping the Aiel people. This allowed trade to thrive in the waste and in Kyrian, and the Kyrian people became very, very wealthy. In 972 of the New Age, Tigraine Mantiar, the daughter heir of Andor, was told by Aes Sedai Gitara Morosa that if she did not leave and become a maiden of the spear, the world would suffer. So she disappears from the palace in Caimon and travels to the Aya Waste. She becomes a far to rise Mai, or a Maiden of the Spear, despite not being born of the Aiel, and that kind of broke custom there. None of the Aiel knew her true origins, but she went by the name Shail, which means woman who is dedicated in the old tongue. She did tell the Aiel of a child that she had left behind that she loved, and a husband that she did not. We later find out that that child was Galad Demadred, and the husband was Tarangale Damadred, who would later remarry Morgase Tricand and Father Elaine. Shail is adopted into the Chumai Sept of the Tardad Aiel, and eventually falls in love with the clan chief Janduin. Now, they did not get married, or else she would have been required to give up the spear, but around 20 years prior to the start of the books, the king of Kyrian, Laman Damadred, uncle to Moraine, cuts down the Avendaloradera tree in Kyrian as he wanted to make a throne out of it that would set him apart from other kings. Now, when the Aiel hear about this, they're pissed. Four entire clans were sent over the Dragon Wall to bring Laman to justice, prompting what is called the Aiel War in the Westlands. Janduin and Shail both went with the Aiel across the Dragon Wall. They fought in Kyrian and at Tarvalin, with the war ending in what was referred to as the Blood Snow. The Aiel finally caught and killed Laman at the Battle of the Shining Walls right outside Tarvalin. At that time, Shail, who had been pregnant but was hiding it, gave birth on the slopes of Dragon Mount to a child and immediately fell dead. This child would be found by an Andoran farmer who was serving in the Ilyanar army at the time and raised as Randall Thor in the Two Rivers. The Aiel, having defeated and punished Laman, retreated back across the Dragon Wall and stayed there until the events of the Great Hunt, when small bands of scouting units were sent back into the Westlands to look for signs of He Who Comes with the Dawn. In terms of population, the Aiel actually have a fairly low population, uh, despite living in a really large area, uh, which is the Aiel Waste. Yet their actual population is probably surprisingly high for most readers. It can be estimated that there are roughly two to three million total Aiel at the beginning of the story. Now, although it's not explicitly stated, it can be assumed based on some numbers that we do know. For one, we know the Shido had roughly 160,000 spears with them when they crossed the Dragon Wall into Kyrian. That number eventually grows by defectors and from other clans. We also know that the Shido end up bringing their entire clan, uh, including civilians with them. So there were roughly about 200,000 Shido. Assuming that the other clans are similar in size, which we are led to believe they are, 
it can be assumed that the population is between 2 and 3 million as there are 12 clans. The other Aiel clans only brought warriors to follow Rand, so they left all their civilians back in the waste, which is why Rand only had roughly 500,000 Aiel under his command for most of the story, but not the other million plus that were back in the Aiel waste living their lives. The majority of the Aiel population live in what would be considered towns in the Westlands. Now these are called holds uh, in the waste, and they're presided over by a roof mistress who has absolute power within her hold, even over a clan chief. There are no major cities in the Aiel waste other than Roydeon, which comes later in the story. Now Roydeon was the lost city built by the Gen Aiel, and it was used for the ceremony of raising new clan chiefs and wise ones. It was also the location of many stored objects of power that the Aiel had been protecting since the Age of Legends. After Rand reveals the secrets of the Aiel to everybody, Roydeon becomes populated as the first city in the Waste, but it's not heavily populated during the events of the story. Rand is able to find an aquifer deep under the ground at Roydeon, and by tapping it, he forms a lake at the edge of the city, and the fountains built within the city start to run. Now, it will gradually gain more and more population, and it will become the only major city in the Waste. Now, other than the Holds, there are not many other types of towns or cities within the Waste for the Aiel. Now, in terms of appearance, most Aiel have a very similar look within the story. They are very much taller than the average person, with most of them being well over six feet tall, with some of them being as much as seven feet tall. Red hair is a dominant trait with the Aiel, although there are Aiel with darker hair and darker eyes. Because of the climate and the land that they live in, they are tanned, despite having red hair. Aiel wear the Cadensor, which they use now as a battle uniform, but this is a traditional uniform that was worn back when they served the Aes Sedai in the Age of Legends. It was basically their work uniform. Aiel culture is extremely well fleshed out within the story, and it would take an hour to run through all of the customs of the Aiel in depth, so I will talk about a couple major features of their culture and their customs. The main custom that governs everything within the Aiel culture is the concept of Ji Ito. Ji Ito means honor and obligation in the old tongue, and it's the code with which the Aiel live by, and simultaneously a very simple concept, but also extremely complex in practice. At its core, Aiel operate on a system of honor that governs them both corporately with each other and internally. They strive very hard to avoid the shame of dishonor while at the same time feeling a need to atone for this dishonor. This is a simple concept, but what the Aiel find to be honorable and what they find to be shameful is very complex. For example, Aiel society is certainly a warrior society, but killing your enemies is considered less honorable than capturing them. Capturing an enemy brings the greatest honor, and captured enemies, because of Jiito, would serve their captors for one year and a day meekly as a servant because they need to atone for this toe. They would be called Gaishine, and this voluntary act of service is meant to atone for their loss of honor at being captured. Now, of course, certain people are exempt from becoming Gaishine. Wise ones, children, pregnant women, women that have children under the age of 10, and blacksmith cannot be made Gaishine, and they are always set free when captured. Aiel that feel they have toe, or obligation towards another, will do many things to try and meet their toe. Now again, toe means obligation is an essentially an Aiel term for they felt that they dishonored themselves. Some Aiel will ask for manual labor or beatings as punishment to meet their toe, or they will be asked to be made Gaishine. Once Toe has been met in Aiel society, whatever caused it is completely forgotten and is considered as though it never happened. So a couple odd things about Aiel culture, they do not find nudity to be shameful. Uh, in fact, they often bathe together and nudity and it's quite common for both men and women to be nude around each other. However, it's considered very shameful to have public displays of affection even between a married men and women. Other major customs for the Aiel include very different roles for men and women in their society than their neighbors in the Westlands. A few examples of these are the fact that only men may become a clan chief, but only women can hold and own property. Women can become wise ones, men may not, and wise ones are honored by all the clans in Aiel society. Women may ask a man to marry them, but men may not ask a woman. Men can make their affection known through gifts, but a woman must initiate the relationship and the marriage by creating a bridal wreath and laying it at the man's feet. Aiel also practice polygamy, although it does have some rules. Men may have more than one wife, but the women must become sister wives through a ceremony and share the man as sisters. Both women must be in agreement as well as the man in question. Women do not have multiple husbands, though, in Aiel society. The Aiel live in what they call the Threefold Land, and what the peoples of the Westlands call the Aiel Waste. The Aiel call it the Threefold Land because it was meant to be a punishment for their sins against the Aes Sedai, a testing ground for their courage, 
and an anvil to shape them. The environment is very unforgiving and desolate, with little greenery and it's pretty much mostly desert. There's almost no water other than some wells, some streams, and a couple different springs. Although it's, there's very little water at the surface though, there is evidence to suggest that there are vast underground aquifers within the waste, similar to the one near Roideon. Now geographically, the waste is about 1,600 miles wide at its widest point and about 2,000 miles tall. Not including the turmoil, which is completely uninhabited and devoid of life, so we're not going to count that. So the Iowa Waste is a very vast area for having such a small population, with really only having a population density of around 1.5 people per square mile of land. The waste stretches from the Dragon Wall in the west to the Cliffs of Dawn in the east, which are the border with Shara. In the south is the Turmul, called the Waterless Sands, for the complete and utter lack of water there. And then, of course, you have the Mountains of Doom to the north. Now, geographically, the waste is a desert, but it's not like a full sand dune type of desert, the way most people might think of the Sahara. There is some plant life, there are animals indigenous to the waste, and that's not to take anything away, though, from how dangerous it is. Those that are not familiar with the landscape of the Ayo Waste can die from dehydration or be killed by some of the unfamiliar animal and plant life. The entirety of the waste is very isolated from the rest of the world, given that there are very few ways to get in. There are just a couple mountain passes from the Westlands. There are six trade towns uh, in Shara along the Cliffs of Dawn. Those are really the only ways to get into the Ayo Waste. So that sort of explains the complete isolation and independent development of the culture over time with the Ayo people. The Ayo economy is an interesting one. We don't get much information pertaining to how daily life in the Ayo waste would function, but there does not seem to be any central form of money or banking within the waste. Each hold seems to provide for its members, and the individual people are very self-sufficient. Now, that's not to say there aren't forms of wealth, however. The Ayo have captured quite a bit of wealth from other nations and from each other over time by using one of their customs called the Fifth. The Fifth is a custom where once an enemy is defeated, the conquering army is allowed to take exactly one-fifth of the wealth of the conquered people, but no more. Now, how exactly they calculate the Fifth is never really explained, uh, but... This does include art, gold, weaponry, or whatever the IEO view is valuable. The IEO do not seem to have any real exports of their own other than facilitating some trade with Shara, which does provide silk and spices to the Westlands. The other route for these items to make their way to the Westlands is through the Sea Folk, um, also trading with Shara through their port cities. Other than this trade that comes through Shara, the Ayel seem to keep everything they create because they really need it to survive, and they don't really seem like interested in exporting their goods. They're not overly interested in the accumulation of wealth in the same way that the nobles and peoples of the Westlands might be. All of this is to say that there are still trade that occurs within the waste, though. Water is a commodity within the waste, and peddlers are welcome with an escort uh, within the waste, and they bring goods goods like tobacco and other consumer goods that the Ayil will often barter for. The Ayil are not governed by one body until they're united by Randall Thor. They do have shared culture and shared social structures, however. The Ayil are divided into 12 different clans. Those clans are the Charin, the Kodara, the Darain, the Goshin, the Miyagoma, the Nakai, the Ren, the Sharad, the Shido, the Shiende, the Tardad, and the Tomanel. Each clan is ruled over by a clan chief. Now, clan chiefs are chosen to undergo a test of worthiness where they enter the sacred city of Roideon after four wise ones have given them permission to try. There they learn about the history of the Aiel in the Tarangriol. Now, two out of every three potential clan chiefs that enter do not return, as learning about the true history of the Aiel is too much for most of them to bear. If they do return, they come back with tattoos on one of their forearms in the shape of dragons. If a chief ever were to come back with two tattoos, he would be he who comes with the dawn, which is what Rand eventually becomes. Clan chiefs are not absolute rulers, though. More kind of like first among equals. They do, however, provide judgment in criminal cases, and they lead in times of war. Each clan is divided into many different septs and then individual holds. These septs have leaders which typically report to the clan chief, again, as the chief is the first among equals. Oftentimes, the sept leaders will be the ones chosen to become the next clan chief when one dies. Additionally, an equally, if not more powerful part of the Aiel leadership are the wise ones. Wise ones are women within Aiel society that are marked for their wisdom and strength. While most wise ones are unable to channel, all of those women who are able to channel in Aiel society are found and trained to become wise ones. Some Aiel wise ones are also dreamwalkers, which is something that has not been forgotten among the Aiel like it has been from the Aes Sedai. To become a wise one, potentials are sent to Roideon for a first 
first time. And then after some extensive training, they are sent again. Aiel Wise Ones do not receive the markings the clan chiefs receive. Wise Ones have a good amount of power within Aiel society, and Wise Ones of any clan or sept are respected by the Aiel regardless of their clan or sept. They advise the chiefs and other leaders in Aiel society, and they have a great deal of influence. So most Aiel society is based around their military. Think like Spartans in the desert. Almost every member of their society is trained to fight and survive, and they're considered to be the greatest warriors in the world. Their government and structures that we've already talked about are also their military structures, as their government essentially is a military government. This is what's interesting about the Aiel is that they actually have more breakdowns in structure for their government beyond their own clan. So we talked about the clans, but now let's talk about the warrior societies. Most Aiel are members of one of 12 warrior societies that operate within the Aiel society, and they all play different roles. These societies are loyal to one another over their clan. So for instance, if the Tardot and Shido clans were at war with one another, the Maidens of the Spear in each of those clans would not fight one another, but would fight the rest of the clan. In Aiel society, the warrior society supersedes the clan. Each of these clans plays a different role within Aiel culture and within the Aiel military. The Athendor, or Red Shields, serve as police among the Aiel and they will often solve crimes or catch criminals. A notable Red Shield was Ruark, who was a Red Shield before he became the clan chief of the Tardot. The Kordurai, or Night Spears, are a society that excels in guarding encampments and holds. The Duade Mahadin, are, or Water Seekers, are a warrior society that specializes in finding water, which is hard to find in the waste and scavenging meat and plants and food. A notable water seeker is Derek, who was the clan chief of the Ren Aiel. The Far Aldazar Dean, or Brothers of the Eagle, are a warrior society based around scouting and specifically in mountainous areas. Far Darais Mai, or Maidens of the Spear, are another group of scouts among the Aiel, uh, as well as being interrogators of prisoners. Now, what separates them from the other societies is that the Maidens are obviously all women. The other societies are entirely male, but the Maidens are entirely female. They consider themselves to be wedded to the Spear, and they must stop being a Maiden if they wish to marry a man. There are many notable Maidens within the story from Amis and Avienda to Bane and Chiad, Sulin, and even Rand's mother Shail. Hama Nadore, or Mountain Dancers, are a society that specializes in combat within mountainous areas, and they've learned to make this a strength rather than a disadvantage. The Rahin Sorai, or Dawn Runners, are a society that specializes in being the frontline troops or the first to attack in battle. The Siea Dune, or Black Eyes, specialize in fighting at night and the questioning of prisoners. A notable member of the Black Eyes Society is Kuladin. When he claims that he's the Karakarn, his society disowns him, and due to that dishonor, they vow to kill him. Shamad Conde, or Thunderwalkers, are a society that specializes in being like the reinforcements or the reserve troops for the Aiel. They're known to be very, very headstrong, according to Avienda. The Shayin Matal, or Stone Dogs, are a society that specializes in being the rear guard for the army. They have a strict vow to never retreat and will fight until the very end to protect the army or clan. A notable Stone Dog is Gaul. The Sovin Nai, or Knife Hands, are a society that are considered to be the best hand-to-hand -hand combat fighters of the Aiel. Now, what's interesting is though they carry the the name knife hands they rarely use any weapons other than their own hands and feet uh, but they are very very proficient at killing people with their hands and feet the last society is the tyin shari or true bloods and they have a very secretive purpose they will not share that with anybody and so we really don't know it either um, but nobody really knows what their purpose is these warrior societies all report to their individual clan chiefs but again their primary loyalty is to their society over their clan at least in direct confrontations The Aiel are primarily a military power, not a political power. They're isolationist, and if Randall Thor didn't bring them over the Dragon Wall, they would have stayed out of the Westland's politics. Now, from a military standpoint, they are more powerful united than potentially all of the rest of the nations of the Westlands combined. The only group that would represent a major threat to them would be the Shan Chan. Avienda sees in the Tangriol in Roydion that the Aiel would cease to exist if they came into conflict with the Shan Chan alone. So when it comes to overall power, the Aiel are an isolationist group that are not unified, but they're extremely dangerous militarily. They do not seek economic or political power, and they're also very difficult to engage in diplomacy with because they're not motivated by the same things that motivate other Westlands nations. They're not into accumulating wealth. They don't want to accumulate land. At least everybody but the Shido doesn't.
There are a few significant landmarks for the IEO people. The largest of these landmarks is obviously the only city within the waste, Roydeon. Roydeon is an unfinished yet grand city constructed by the Gen IEL. At its center is a square that houses the Tarangriol used by the Wise Ones and Clan Chiefs when they're raised, as well as many different objects of power that were transported and guarded by the Daishane IEL over the centuries. After the coming of Randall Thor, Moraine has most of the Trangreal and other objects of the power taken away, and Rand raises a lake from under the ground, so the city becomes more and more populated as more people move there. Another significant landmark is al Dal. This is a meeting place for the Aiel clan chiefs in the Waste. Now, in the old tongue, it means Golden Bowl, which is due to the fact that the location is a canyon that's completely round, and it has some perfect acoustics for people that want to, like, yell across at each other from a distance. It's frequently used as a meeting place for the clan chiefs, and was most recently used when Rand revealed himself to be the Karakarn. The Aiel play an extremely important and central role in the story of the Wheel of Time. Not only are they major characters within the plot, but their culture is central to the history and prophecy that brings about the Dragon Reborn. And their participation in the last battle is vital to the ultimate victory of the Light. Their culture is among the most prominently featured in the story, and it's one of the more well-fleshed out and unique cultures within the Wheel of Time, and really within fantasy literature. So this is an interesting question. We have a possible future for the Aiel within the novels as Avienda sees a version of the future in which the Aiel go to war with the Shanchan and end up being completely exterminated within a few generations. However, this future is seemingly avoided as Avienda successfully campaigns to have Rand include the Aiel within the Dragon's Peace rather than being kind of left out of it. The thought process was that a dull tool is no longer effective. By giving the Aiel a tool in this analogy, constant sharpening and purpose, they would never grow dull and would remain powerful. I do think there's merit to this, and by including the Aiel in the Dragon's Peace, it means that if the Shan Chan ever did decide to invade the rest of the Westlands, the Aiel would not be alone in their fight, but rather would be backed by the other nations of the Westlands, the Black Tower, the White Tower, and this ultimately would be such a deterrent for the Shan Chan aggression that they would likely not advance. In regards to their culture, I think there are bound to be changes. Their traditions will eventually change as the purpose for most of them no longer exists. They are no longer bound to the Aiel Waste, but rather actually bound to the Westlands as part of the Dragon's Peace. There are no secrets now that Rand has revealed the entire history of the Aiel to all of the people, and the Dark One and the Shadow are no more. However, the Aiel have survived thousands of years, and I think their culture would largely remain intact and would become well ingrained with the other cultures of the Westlands. They would be seen more and more as heroes rather than villains, as they did participate in the defeat of the Dark One, and in the same way as the Black Tower, they would go from being pariah figures to being looked up to. So in general, what do I think of the Aiel? I have mixed feelings. On one hand, I love how well fleshed out they are, I love how deep their culture is, and the Aiel are one of the main reasons that Robert Jordan is so respected for world building. They have a distinct and unique culture. Sure, they pull inspiration from Native Americans and the Fremen from Frank Herbert's Dune, but they are very distinct and very unique from those cultures, and they have quite a bit of depth. I can say I think they're very well executed. Now, all that being said, I don't necessarily agree with their morality and their customs. They have customs that can be quite violent in meeting toe over what can be very, very dumb things uh, that they view as dishonor, at least in my view. I think sometimes while reading this, it comes across as very admirable to people, like the ideal Aiel are so honorable, but in reality, it's sort of frightening. Like they kill people for being dishonored. Like you looked at me weird and dishonored me, I killed you. Uh, and in reality, that's that's messed up. They give the idea sometimes of being enlightened and wise, and you just tend to think that the wise ones are just smarter than everybody, but yet they can't shake calling an entire group of people tree killers and hating them based on one stupid thing that one king did 20 years ago that most of the people didn't even know about. There are times that their morality and intelligence seem inconsistent, but really, who isn't that true of in the real world? Moral ambiguity exists in every culture. So what do you all think of the Aiel? Do you hate them? Do you love them? Do you find them boring? Do you wish there was more of them? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And again, quick reminder about the Patreon promotion. Sign up to be a Dreadlord level or higher and get 10% off at shopwheeloftime.com. While you're at it, grab a map there or a cool mug like this one that I was able to customize. You can customize your own mug there and it all supports the channel. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and make sure to hit the bell icon to be notified when I release new Wheel of Time content. That's all I do here. Thanks for watching, and big thanks again to Sergeant She-Wolf for sponsoring the video. Until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. 
The mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free, crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? 